Well, hello everybody, boys and girls, those who bounce in between. It's Comrade Danky here today with part two of our look into the anarchist YouTuber re-education. This time, we're looking into his video, How To Revolution. So let's get started. Hi, I'm Aaron, and this is my show, Re-Education. And I'm an anarcho-communist now. And I'm sure as interested as all of you must be to hear about how I transformed from concern. It, it's kind of weird to me that he's wearing like that Soviet style hat and plays the Internationale while he's like proudly proclaiming that he's an anarchist. Um, but you know, whatever. To classical liberal to anarcho-communist, I feel like there's a few more things in the world that are a little bit more important than that. And we're going to discuss them in this new video series that I'm calling how to Revolution. Let's get started. You know, it's interesting. Through the course of history, you tend to notice that things don't necessarily repeat themselves, but they do somewhat echo. And something that's been constantly echoing through my brain recently is the old saying, you have to know thy enemy as you know thyself. So, let's talk about ourselves. What exactly is our goal? I mean, a lot of you out there are Marxists, Leninists, Socialists anarchists like myself, it would be to fight fascism, right? Okay, well, to know exactly how to fight fascism, we have... Um, so already we're sort of off to a weird start. I thought this video was how to do a revolution. By that I meant, I thought you meant how to do a socialist revolution. Like how to build a dictatorship of the proletariat. Now you're talking about fighting fascism, which, you know, the two aren't mutually exclusive. But fighting fascism is just one small part of the proletarian revolution. Fascism often comes as a reaction to the overarching proletarian revolution. So, I don't know, you're kind of like shifting focus here. I don't know if it's just me. I have to know what fascism is. So what exactly is the definition of fascism? Well, an old but very correct definition would be the belligerent nationalist dictatorship of the extreme right typically achieved through the merging of state and business. So that would mean that to fight fascism, we would have to fight the state. So how exactly would we go about doing something like that? That sounds like an incredibly large task. I don't know how we would even be able to begin to achieve such a thing. And my answer would be through direct action. So you're probably saying to yourself, oh, so now we need to go around hitting people, right? Wrong. Direct action doesn't necessarily mean violent action. It just means that you don't rely on politics. The okay, so we can see he's using footage of the Tiananmen Square protests to talk about using direct action to fight fascism. I feel like it's a little bit misleading to use the footage of the Tiananmen protests to talk about fighting fascism, but... I think, more annoyingly, let's break down what he just said. Violent act. Right? Wrong. Direct action doesn't necessarily mean violent action. It just means that you don't rely on politics. The so direct action doesn't necessarily mean violent action. It just means you don't rely on politics. So, yeah, this is kind of a strange definition of direct action what kind of direct action can you take that isn't political in nature that doesn't have overarching class antagonisms built into it i don't really understand what kind of direct action is re-education talking about that doesn't have a political underpinning the way that i like to look at it is don't punch the nazi punch the message sometimes you still have to punch the nazi though how do we go about doing this? How do we... So we don't punch the Nazi, we punch the message. And he was saying that direct action doesn't necessarily mean violence. So is he saying that we should not use violence to fight Nazis? Is he really saying that? Um, because let me tell you this, friend. The Nazis have zero qualms using violence to combat their enemies. So, from a pragmatic sense, we need to be prepared to do whatever we have to do 
to fight fascism. It's kind of strange that you're saying don't punch Nazis, punch the idea, when often the idea of Nazism is being perpetuated by real physical flesh and blood Nazis that you can indeed punch. And by punching them, you can silence them. We initiate direct action. The best thing to... How do we go about doing this? How do we initiate direct action? The best thing to do is to think tactically. Now, there are a few things that you have to know. Nazis, and neoliberals for that matter, are basically just the hired goons of the state. They... Um, who does he think the state consists of? The state consists of Nazis and neoliberals, you know, in this example. The state consists of capitalists. It's not... Capitalism, neoliberalism, and Nazism are not mutually exclusive terms. You can be a neoliberal and be a Nazi. You can be a capitalist and be a Nazi. You can be a capitalist and be a neoliberal. All of these things are not mutually exclusive terms. Work. For basically just the hired goons of the state. They work for capital. They are not necessarily the elites. They are not necessarily the ones in control. They are hired goons. Okay, so, so point to me a leader of a capitalist bourgeois society who is not themselves a member of the bourgeoisie. Um, who is not being controlled by the bourgeoisie. And <laughs> it, it, it's, it's weird. He's trying to show that there is this sort of divorce between neoliberals and fascists on one hand, and then their capitalist overlords on the other. I'm trying to say that those two things, those two categories, they might as well be one singular category. Neoliberalism is a manifestation of capitalism. Just as fascism is a manifestation of capitalism. They're not mutually exclusive. What happens when you punch them? Well, punching the goons feels really good, but it looks really bad to potential allies. You have to remember something. It looks really bad to punch them. Well, punching the goons feels really good, but it looks really bad to potential allies. Um... So he just said that punching Nazis may feel good, but it's bad optics, you guys. And we could potentially recruit more people if we didn't use violence to suppress fascism. That's what this anarchist is telling us right now. Don't use violence to oppose fascism, because think about the optics. Think about all the centrist liberals we could have recruited if we hadn't have dared punch that Nazi. You have to remember something. The right wing, the far right, the extreme right, the fascists, they're not stupid. And that's, that's another thing I disagree with. I think they are stupid. On some level, if you are buying into this reactionary bullshit, you are stupid. You can be a genius you could be a brain surgeon, a rocket scientist, in every other field uh, of your life. But in terms of politics, if you think along these conservative right-wing reactionary lines, you are an idiot, sir. And Nazis aren't idiots. There's one thing... Nazis... <laughs> Nazis are idiots. And I will debate you uh, on that any day of the week, re-education. I cannot believe I am having to sit here and listen to an anarchist tell you don't punch Nazis, don't use violence on Nazis, Nazis aren't idiots. You know, I know he's saying all this within the context of fighting against them, but it still seems like you're giving them way too much credence here. Yes, they're not stupid. And Nazis aren't idiots. There's one thing that they understand very well. That's good optics. And good optics is something that we on the left could really stand to learn a little bit about. Part of those optics is that all of the Nazis and neoliberals tend to wear suits. <laughs> you know what? He's got us. He's got us there, folks. Um, the reason why there aren't more Marxists in the world is because there aren't people wearing expensive-ass thousand dollar suits standing up on a podium 
lecturing you about why you should be a Marxist. When the fancy, beautiful people, the talking suit, bougie elite, tell you it's okay, then it's okay. When, when it becomes acceptable for them, then it's acceptable for you. And all manner of propaganda makes us believe that people that wear suits are good, honest individuals who should be respected. I honestly have not... I've seen propaganda that said the opposite. I've seen propaganda that's like, look out for the guy in the suit. All those politicians, they're just talking suits, trying to tell you whatever uh, they want you to hear so that they can get your vote. And then they'll sell you out the second they get in office. Um, if anything, I've heard more propaganda advising people to watch out against these slick, uh, slicked back hair, uh, suave, suit wearing, uh, silver tongued, uh, capitalist, neoliberal assholes. And again, let me let me just say that people aren't attracted to white supremacy because of suits. <laughs> They're attracted because of the hateful. Uh, bigoted rhetoric that Richard Spencer is spewing out of his mouth. He appeals to these, to the fear centers of these uh, idiot conservative reactionary inbred hick chuds who eat that shit up. They teach themselves that, you know, the white man used to be on top and now they're on the bottom and they're being destroyed by the Jewish global conspiracy, what have you, and uh, damn it, it's time for the white man to stand up and take charge. That kind of thing has an appeal to a certain reactionary demographic, whether you're wearing uh, a fancy uh, tuxedo suit or you're wearing uh, absolutely nothing and you're standing buck naked in a trailer park. It appeals to these chuds all the same. Suit or no suit. Nazism appeals to the masses based upon its reactionary politics. It has nothing to do with the suit. <laughs> and the fact that this guy seems to think the suit has anything to do with the reason why people reject uh, far left politics and accept far right politics is completely naive. I mean, we as anarchists, socialists, communists, and so forth probably don't believe that, but the majority of people don't see people wearing suits as the enemy, they see them as being good guys. So when you have somebody like Richard Spencer, who is wearing a suit, holding himself quite well, talking very elegantly to the- Surrounded by people Sieg Heiling while he's calling for ethnic cleansing. Again, it's not- the suit has jack shit to do with it. He could be standing up there wearing a stained, uh, uh wife beater t-shirt and in his boxer shorts and they would still be cheering for him and giving him the Sieg Heil. The camera, even though what he's saying is absolutely reprehensible. And then you all of a sudden have somebody from Antifa come and punch him in the face. The person from Antifa is dressed in black, their face is covered, they look like a thug, they seem like a criminal. I would never condone violence, but if you are going to hit somebody, I would suggest that you dress up not like a mass marauder, but more like, I don't know, a plumber. Or okay, okay, okay. Okay. He said I would never condone violence. Again, what is re-education's problem with saying, yeah, it's okay to use violence against fascists? Uh, you heard it here on this channel first, ladies and gentlemen. It's okay to punch a Nazi. If you see a Nazi, punch that motherfucker in the face. Send him back into his mommy's basement and make him scared to come out. All right, don't let that Nazi stand on the uh, street corner spewing his bullshit while fucking CNN uh, records a, a, an interview for him? Don't let them platform him. I, I commend this comrade for standing up and giving Richard Spencer the, the punching that he deserves. He deserved a good punch in the fucking face. And let me tell you this, re-education, since you're so enlightened on how to do a revolution, maybe I should tell you a little bit something about why Antifa wears masks. It's so they're not doxxed by Nazi the person groups from online Antifa's and their identities aren't exposed, they're hunted down and killed. Because that thing is a very real possibility for anti-fascist activists. That's why we hide our face. That's why I don't show my face on this channel. Because I don't want some dipshit uh, uh, chud fucking finding out where I live and killing me. 
So you you sort of scorn this brave comrade who did an action far more brave than anything you've done for the movement, I'm sure. Uh, anything that I've done, most definitely. And you say because he's dressed like a criminal, that discredits his actions. Is dressed in black, their faces covered, they look like a thug, they seem like a criminal. I would never condone violence, but if you are going to hit somebody, I would suggest that you dress up not like a mass marauder, but more like, I don't know, a plumber or a nurse. Yeah, that plumber or that nurse would be very quickly identified by white supremacist message boards online. They would be harassed, they would be targeted. So yeah, if you want to paint a giant target on your face and say, come kill me, white nationalist, then by all means, do it. I live in Tennessee. It's a very dangerous spot to live to speak out against white nationalists. And yet I do it, but I don't go putting my face every fucking where saying, come find me. I'm not afraid. <laughs> I'm, I'm fucking afraid. I'm, and if you're not afraid of fascist retaliation, then you're a fucking fool. At least that way, it looks like the Nazi is getting punched out by a regular individual. This person was extremely brave for uh, hitting Richard Spencer. Extremely brave. And I would never go so far as to condemn their actions and say, how dare you, sir? How dare you use violence against that Nazi? You are dressed like a common thug. What kind of reactionary take is this? Jewel, if you put that show on mute, who is going to look like the aggressor in this situation? It's going to be the good guy. We don't want that to happen. That's why you have to think tactically. But Okay, but again, look at yourself, look at this whole situation. The mainstream media is giving a platform to a fascist. This, uh, the person who punched him is a comrade trying to deplatform fascist by any means necessary, including using what you call direct action to silence him. And then you scorn him for it. You say, how dare you, sir? Think about the optics. Well, the optics are already favoring fascism. The C CNN aren't interviewing the anti-fascist. They're not interviewing the guy who would punch Richard Spencer. They're interviewing Richard Spencer. So the optics are already not in your favor. And if you're worried about what the capitalist media thinks and how they perceive you, then you're fighting for the wrong reasons, comrade. You should be fighting for the people. Who gives a flying fuck if CNN thinks that Antifa is like a terrorist sleeper cell? Alright, that's CNN. They live pie in the sky up on Mount Olympus with all the other bougie fat cat bastards who uh, continuously leech off of this society. You should be performing your action for the people. And that's what this comrade was doing. He wasn't doing it for his personal glory. He didn't put his face out there and say, my name is Billy Bob Joe and I punched Richard Spencer. Uh, he did this to deplatform a Nazi. The fact that you condemn this action speaks volumes for you. Go on mute, who is going to look like the aggressor in this situation? It's going to be the good guy. We don't want that to happen. That's why you have to think tactically. But that also means that you don't want to fall into the liberal trap. Holding hands outside of a Denny's in the dedicated free speech zone will not make change. Voting will not make change. And making a change.org petition will not make change. So then you ask yourself, how do we fight these people? We can't hit them and we can't take the high ground. So what do we do? Well, it's simple. We have to give them a stronger message. So what does that mean? What is this message? What am I talking about? Well, let's go back to the very beginning. Remember, at I think re-education is confused uh, as to what system we currently live under. We don't live in the free marketplace of ideas, contrary to what the intellectual dark web likes to whine about. There is no free marketplace of ideas. There is a limited space of ideas in this marketplace, and in the American marketplace, there is only room for so much. And the media will prop up certain ideas over others. The political system will favor certain ideas over others. The culture will favor certain ideas over others. And do you know what influences that culture? Do you know what influences that media? 
Do you know what influences that political system? It's capitalism, my friend. We live under capitalism. So if you're trying to put a message out there and rely on your message to defeat fascism, well then congratulations, you just started a propaganda war with the entire mainstream media and the bajillions of dollars that they have oozing out of their ass. So yeah, good luck using your humble YouTube channel to fight against the overwhelming horde of capitalist anti-communist rhetoric out there. It's really going to go great. Not using violence, not using the people's majority, not doing anything like that to fight against fascism. Just trying to put your message out there and fight them in the marketplace of ideas. This is how an anarchist does a revolution, ladies and gentlemen. At the very start of this, I introduced the topic by saying, Know your enemy as you know yourself. Now let's get to know them. How do you think that we would do that, though? Should we go spying on their community? Should we start tapping their phone lines? Should we put intel agents into each one of their Facebook channels and just find out every single little thing that they're doing? Yeah. Well, maybe that might not hurt, but a better solution would be to know their tactics. So what are their tactics? Well, that's something we're going to get into in the next video with the first tactic, control the conversation. Thanks. All right, so that was painful to watch. Um, I'm sure there will be more videos of this guy to come. Re-education. Uh, there's additional parts to this. I'll be sure to check them out. And if they're anything like this, it'll give me a lot to react to. But in short, he basically said, we should do a revolution by fighting fascism, not through violence, but by engaging them on the marketplace of ideas. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just pictured, like, Stalin and Hitler sitting down at a formal debate. Maybe Churchill was moderating. And the two of them had a lengthy, wordy debate accused each other of ad hominems and ad hoc post ergo hoc and the whole shebang and at the end of the day Stalin comes out on top he won the battle of ideas and and instead of fighting World War II that's how it was resolved <laughs> that's man I mean I just I don't know what world this guy lives in that he thinks that that uh, ideas alone can win a revolution what kind of, you know, no pun intended, but what kind of idealism is this? I don't know. <laughs> Happy holidays, everybody. Stay tuned for, I guess, part three.